The Dickheads are presented in color. Hey, Dickheads! Like a pink laser beam of truth beaming from uh, California and Colorado to your brain hole today, we have a special guest joining us on the podcast. Uh, Molly Tanzer is a author, writer, um, and specifically this episode we have her on because she is going to be a judge on this year's pkd awards we're going to get into that later but i want to introduce you to molly and to her work and before we get into the awards uh molly welcome to the dickheads podcast thank you so much it's a pleasure to be on all right so you grew up in the south in florida specifically i believe and how did you get into reading and writing like fantastic literature and the and and, and fantasy sci-fi that kind of thing? You know, it's funny. I am from the South. I was born in Georgia, and I moved to um, Florida when I was a teenager. And it's interesting. Um, one of the reasons that uh, one of the main exposures I had to fantastical and speculative literature was my dad. Um, he was a huge fan of all things science fiction and fantasy, he read constantly. He traveled a ton for work and he would often buy, uh, like he would read all these long series because they would sort of keep him company when he was on the road. And he not only had those books around, but he also uh, read to me as a kid. And so he, uh, we would often read a chapter in bed before I would go to sleep when he was home. And those books were typically very speculative as well. Like we started with The Hobbit and we started with The Chronicles of Narnia. We started with The Chronicles of Prydain all of those classic stuff, all that classic stuff, right? And then as I became older and started reading more on my own, I started exploring all the books that he had brought home. And we had different fantasy, we had different tastes in fantasy. Like he often went for those um, like series by the pound ones, like Wheel of Time and things like that. Right. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed a couple of different things. Like I ate up the Pern books when I was a kid and r read a lot of Xanth just a lot when I think about that in the context of sort of going back to those books and looking at them and being like, Oh, these are interesting. Um, but I, um, he really got me started in that way and encouraged me. And I, so I was reading like Stephen Bruce and I was reading Anne McCaffrey and I was reading Ursula K. Le Guin and all of these amazing writers. Mm -hmm. Science fiction was actually a harder sell for me until I was a little bit older, but yeah, fantasy, I was, my dad and I would just keep neck and neck with fantasy until basically until he uh, passed away. Yeah, I can see a lot of those roots um, it, in your work, um, you know, coming to fruition. And I'm always jealous of, of you uh, writers who had um, science fiction and fantasy reader parents because, uh, you know, my dad did a lot of reading, but it was mostly political science textbooks. Uh, <laughs> but my mother and father did encourage me to read genre and my mom did read some with me. But that's really cool that your father... And you and your father had that relationship. Did he get a chance to see the success that you had in, in writing? No, he actually passed away before he um, he passed away before the publication of my first collection, A Pretty Mouth, in 2012. Um, so mm -hmm. he knew that I was putting it out. He knew that I was um, working with the woman who would eventually become my agent for um, my debut novel, Vermilion. But no, he never, he saw like a couple short stories, but that was it. And so it's strange, um, you know, he passed away nine years ago this year. And thinking about how far I've come during that time period, um, it's one of my big weird thoughts is like that he influenced me and this became my life in a, in a big way and that he never really got to see it. So, but I think he knew, he actually told me right before he died, he was like, you're going to be fine. And I was like, oh, thanks, dad. And, you know, so it was like emotional, but he was really proud to see the work I was doing even then. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, I uh, uh, just lost my father recently, so oh, I understand... Um, uh, you know, the, um, and in part, my dad wrote uh, political science textbooks, but the idea that he was like putting ass to chair was a huge influence on me. And it's really cool to hear that your father was such an influence in that way. Yeah. And, and, and on the reading that that's um, kind of makes so much sense having read <laughs> some of your work, like uh, yeah. those, those influences. But um, I think you're as, you know, as an adult, our influences change. And, you know, when you went to um, college, I see a lot of the roots from the things I know about, for example, you studied art history, I know, and um, in school, and 
That seems like it had a pretty big impact on your work too. Um, can you tell us how that those studies had an impact on your work? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, I do have a background in art history. I was an art history major in college and I, um, basically because I ended up in the AP art history class when I was like a senior in high school in like 1999, 2000. Right. And, um, I was like, I'm going to take this AP art history class. It sounds cool. And then I just fell in love with it in high school and did well on the exam. And then, um, basically like the college that I went to was like, well, we'd love to have you study art history here and here's a scholarship. And I was like, Oh, sure. This is not my dream, but like, I do like money. And so like, I, uh, I, and I, and I really ended up getting a ton out of it. I mean, it's, it's because of majoring in art history that I um, studied abroad and lived in Turkey for six months when I, and like right before the, um, right before we went into Iraq, actually, it was in 2002. And now Turkey's so different. It was pre Erdogan, right? So like, I, I'm, I'm very interested in Turkish politics. And it's been like such a strange change to see Turkey now as opposed to Turkey when I lived there. Um, And then yeah, I feel like art history has found its way into a ton of the things that I write. I mean, I, I made a joke the other day, that like, I know that I'm really enjoying the new novel that I'm working on because there is a scene, like, I know, I, I know it's going to be one of the ones that I really relate to as a writer to my own work, because there's a scene where people stop to like contemplate art together and be like, Hmm. Yeah. And it's true. Like I, I often have scenes of everyone looking at a painting together and then like having their own discreet thoughts about it. And like 10 scenes surrounding like people's reactions to art. Cause I'm, I'm often fascinated by that relationship that people have to art and the way that it can reveal the self. Um, so yeah, I love it. And um, I ended up doing humanities for my master's degree, but I did a bunch of art history in there too, as well as all the other different fields that I was bringing together at that time. Yeah. And we'll get to that master's degree in a second, but I think the, because I think that plays a role too, but it's so funny because not now knowing, you know, what you were reading as a kid, I'm sure that um, kind of the way you trained your brain as a child to consume that, fantasy and that that otherworldness kind of um, gave you kind of weapons in your tool or tools in your toolbox for understanding art history as well, too. I'm sure it gave you a leg up that not every art history student had to. I, you know, that's part of it, but I think a lot of it is that um, my family was all very arty. Like my dad was, he, as a reader, he was voracious. And as a consumer of art, he was, he was often fascinated. We visited museums and we, I mean, we had like, um, I, my mom is a musician. And so I got, I don't want to say dragged, but dragged to the symphony a lot as a kid um, and, you know, took music lessons. And so I had a very humanities based upbringing in a lot of that in those ways. And I was very lucky to fall into a, to be, to be in a family that valued the arts. Um, and, and that, that really helped me. And I think part of my fascination with visual art in particular is that um well, you know, there's been this new conversation on Twitter about people who don't have visual imaginations, and I don't. I don't have a visual imagination. I see. I don't have a mind's eye. Um, hmm. I when people describe an image to me, I often get like impressions and sense senses from it. But I rarely, if you say Santa Claus to me, like I don't see like a man with a bowl, like a belly with a bowl full of jelly, like laughing in my mind. You know, I get various impressions of even very iconic images like Santa Claus, and so. I find visual art fascinating because you see the the inner mind represented externally in this way and writing is the same, but because I think I lack that inner mind's eye, like I'm fascinated by people that are able to transcribe what's in that into a sort of a visual medium. Having read your work, I would never have guessed that that was a challenge for you, but. I um... think that, you know, I really appreciate that, but it's so funny because I, I mean, I literally, when I write a fight scene, I, I block it out. I take like items and I put it on my desk and I'm like, okay, who is where and who are they moving? And I, and I push them around almost like a board because I can't keep track of it in my brain. And so um, I often like rely on the technical when it comes to very visual moments or I, I have to plan them and revise them a lot because it's very, very difficult for me to keep an image held in my brain and I need assists in that way. Mm, that's really, God, that's <laughs> interesting. I, that, that's a challenge I... I don't have as a writer. I picture everything very well, but it's funny because I have worked, I have worked with another collaborator who has to stand up and physically move and, and, and do, do that things. And yeah. Yeah. yeah it's a little bit of a martial arts background, not a ton, but like I've done different styles of them over the years. And so I'll, I'll often try to use my own body to 
as like the world's most primitive motion capture, right? So like, be like, okay, well, how would they move around a fist? Because I literally can't even think about two people are punching each other. Like, how are they doing it? And so I often have to embody that on both sides to write it accurately. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting too, because on the revision side of that, like, I find that I primarily move my books, my move my books forward via dialogue, um, not through movement and action. And so I, and I often have, when I go through and I revise, I kind of have to think about people moving and where they're going and, and fill in like scene and scenery details, because those are what come last for me. Uh Uh, I I really, it's like, people want to know what this room looks like. I should put that in this book. And so like, I have to kind of have that mechanical thought and mechanical check because otherwise I'll just like leave it out. Well, you know, it's funny because I had a question later about um, about dialogue because I do remember parts of your, uh, I can't remember which book it was, but I do remember um, having the experience of reading one of your books and having the thought that I bet Molly would really enjoy the Fletch books because they're told almost entirely through dialogue, right? Yeah. And, and I, I had made a note to myself that in one of my reviews of one of your work, I had made a connection uh, and I said, I, I don't think anyone but me might, is, might not see this, but yeah. I was seeing that kind of connection because of there was huge portions that were driven by dialogue. Driven so. by dialogue. And yeah, it's something that I actually try to have been trying to, as I come to a better understanding of myself and my methodology and the ways that I work, it's something that I'm trying to adjust for because I do think earlier things of mine were almost too dialogue heavy or I over rely on, well, I mean, you know, these are all tools, right? You can't use yeah, I get it. people over and over again, right? And so I, I want to challenge myself as I, as, I, as I work and I grow and I change to not only rely on what I always rely on. Yeah. And so, like, sometimes I'm, like, you know, do almost exercise, like, playing scales in my brain where it's, like, well, how could I, intellectually, how could I change the scene without two people having a conversation to change it and give that myself that problem that I'm trying to solve? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, you know, look, the, those Fletch books are amazing and they're almost entirely dialogue. Like they'll, they'll have entire chapters where no, there's no action or named, you know, speech tags, anything. And, and I think they work. But anyway, yeah. so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So you studied uh, for your master's degree, you did um, a focus on slave narratives. And, um, you know, what inspired you to, to work with within that? Um, it's a very interesting field. Um, it is. Fascinating. Yeah. I mean, so um, it's, it was the, the whim of fate, I would say, um, you know, I, one of the ways that my, so my, my field was technically humanities, which had its own department um, that taught humanities classes to the undergraduate population and had humanities classes for um, masters and PhD. I don't think there's a PhD there anymore. Um, but we would take classes outside of our department in literature and music and um, all these different things, right? And so there were sort of prerequisites for my master's that I had to take before I got into the later stuff. And I was like, okay, like, I guess I'll take 18th century literature. That sounds cool. I don't know anything about, I have read Robinson Crusoe. That is the extent of my my knowledge in this way, right? And it ended up being um, a seminar on transatlantic, like novels of the 18th century that had a sort of transatlantic connection. And it changed my life. Dr. Candace Ward taught it. And it, I mean, I was just fascinated by it. I had not really ever encountered that in my education, um, which is a, a shame given that like, I had a really good education. I, you know, I, I went to a really good elementary school, a really good middle school. I went to a high school that was focused on the arts. So it's like a public high school in Palm Beach, Florida, that is for like people who will, who submit portfolios and you have to keep like a high average to even stay there. And then I, you know, I got a really good college education and yet the idea of the transatlantic slave trade and even sort of slavery in the States, especially growing up in Georgia was like nothing that I was ever really taught. Um, It was very sanitized as a child. Um, You know, we learned that racism was something that happened in the past, but then like Dr. Martin Luther King changed all that. And it's a fair show. It doesn't exist. (laughs) I'm, you know, I'm turning 40 this year. Right. So like, this is, you know, this was during the eighties when that sort of like, Oh, inspiration, anyone can do it now. We've solved the problems. And um, especially in Georgia, um, slavery just wasn't talked about. Uh, And it, 
And so when I started learning about sort of British colonialism that made me address my own, the lacunas in my, or the, you know, in my own education, um, and it became something that I was like very, very interested by because it was almost entirely new. And so a lot of these novels did have um, so like slaves or slavery depicted in them. We did read some actual 18th century slave narratives of which there are a few, but a lot of it was white writers, especially women writers who used the novel as a form of advocacy to advocate for amelioration and then later abolition of um, in, like West Indian slavery. And so there were these popular, no and I became fascinated with this idea of the novel as advocacy. You know, how many avenues were there for women to be real advocates in the 18th century? Like their, their lives were often very constrained. And, um, and indeed women were kind of used as this argument for Jamaican slavery, where it was like, well, women have to have their coffee and their tea and their sugar and their and these pro and their like these products of not just West, um, West Indian slavery, but also like those sort of plantation system in India, right? And so women were often blamed for the need for these products of empire in the British Empire. And so it was fascinating to me to see women writers using their art as a site of resistance against that, where they're like, no, these are terrible things, and there's weird and hilarious missteps, and there's 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 tensions there, but I, I really saw it as like a fascinating time for women, as, for women as writers trying to make people's lives better through like popular novels. I don't know. It was like a fascinating, it was a fascinating time. To, mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I just really love that time in my education when I was studying this. So, Yeah, it's, it sounds amazing. And I'm wondering before John Wolheim first put uh, the word science fiction on the pocket guide to science fiction and that we had like, a name for this genre. There was sci-fi and fantasy being written that just didn't have a name. And I'm sure, did you ever come across in your studies of slave narratives, like kind of uh, stealth slave narrative fantasies and, and, and science fiction, or is it more straightforward? Like we're the advocacy and we're telling our story as it happened. Yeah. I, um, that's a really interesting question, especially because like when I was, um, God, like dragging up names for my past, right? So like when I was doing my MA, um, there was actually kind of a question coming out about one of the um, primary uh, primary sources that we have, uh, the the narrative of Odule Aquiano, which is um, like a, a, a story of um, the story of a slave in his own words. And he basically writes this tale of um, growing up in... Um, on, in coastal Africa, I'm sorry, this is like 2009, eight, nine. So this was, is just like, yeah, take your time. I cannot remember the details, um, but like he was um, basically like put on a slave ship and taken to the Americas in some capacity and like, and freed himself, like bought his freedom and became um, like a, a sea ship captain. And so like at the time that I was doing studying, there was like a new study that it, like a guy had been, that was like, this is not true. Like this is, we've always thought that this was like a true story because he claims it's a true story. But if you look at it, it's more like a novel and it's fictionalized. And like, he was probably trying, and like there was an argument that he was making, he was doing this in order to advocate, but it was not necessarily like a whole, wholly biographical that it was like a, a, a compilation of different stories that he was using in this form of advocacy. And so like, I would like say high seas adventure or like, more like um, that it just had l less of a, qu if you look at it on a sentence, this was his claim, not mine. I am not an yeah. expert and I would never make a claim whether this is true or false, but that if you read it on a sentence level, it does carry you along like a novel and less like a autobiography mm -hmm. and that it has like this fictional sense to it, which is true because there were other, uh, like the occasional other, narrative that we would find like there was one by a woman whose name I like, cannot remember out of the depths of time and space um, that definitely had a biographical feel to it mm -hmm. um, and that and Odile Equiano's d doesn't it does have a more narrative flair and so it was fascinating to see sort of that kind of the idea of fiction um, coming into play with it but in terms of speculative fiction it if it exists I do not I did not encounter it mm. Um, and I would love, you know, if anyone who sees this is like, oh, I know of this thing, that would be fascinating. I, the, that class in, in my 18th century studies didn't really bear much on the science fictional or the fantastical. But um, when I was sort of doing a few additional classes in the 19th century, then you really do start to see a lot more of that science fictional and fantastical, like sort of post-Frankenstein fiction that then sort of like takes 
that tack of using the speculative. I mean, like Mm -hmm. I took this amazing class called desire disease in Victorian fiction. That was a lot of stuff about syphilis, but also had a lot of stuff that was speculative, including, um, like, uh, I think we read Villette that has like ghosts. And then like, we read the beetle, which I always, am like, everyone read the beetle because it's this amazing, it was published the same year as Dracula and it outsold Dracula. And it was like a huge publishing sensation in Victorian London, but, um, nobody's really ever, like, it's not as popular anymore. Um, like Dracula survived and the beetle did not, but man, if you want like to basically just do a bump of 19th century weird ideas, it is all there. And it's an amazing book where there's. I'm definitely books. checking it out. <laughs> At yeah, some no, point. It, it's really, really cool. Like the first one is very sort of like a Dickensian or like almost um, like later than that, like a, um, like a Jekyll and Hyde style narrative. And then there's like a, like a lurid science fictional section with like a guy that tries to revive a cat, very like reanimator actually. Um, and then there's like a women's, like a romance section. And then like the final one is a very Victorian, almost Holmesian. Like I was sitting in my office when someone came in and said like, Oh, we need to hire you. You know, like that kind of um, doily style. And so, and it's about like a people should, people should not have brought back an ancient Egyptian artifact to London that causes problems. That is like the nature of that book. Like what it's, it's a scarab that like hosts a being and like that runs amok and it's fabulous. Oh, that's really cool. Well, and we've seen, like Tor did um, with two different authors did novellas of steampunk with uh, Maurice Broaddus and uh, like uh, Pete Jelly Park did a um, really cool steampunk, like Afro Caribbean. Yeah. Like stuff. So you were seeing like the modern authors kind of taking up that mantle a little bit and that's cool. Um, and good stuff too. Uh, but for you um, after all it, it's, hearing you talk about it it's so cool because i can see the alchemy that comes into your work Um, and um i read your first book when it came out a pretty mouth um because uh i was living in portland at the time and and you put it out with lazy fascist and i saw cameron on the regular um around town and i remember uh, him very specifically just you know putting a bug in my ear like hey you're this is really cool work and so i remember reading it early on and I, I, my first thought i remember was just like who is this woman where did she come from she is really talented and yeah. this is her first book are you serious and, well, thank you. that means a lot i appreciate that yeah and i remember um well not you know i'm being upfront with, with everybody with you and like you write a lot in an era I don't generally enjoy, sure. which is the Victorian era. And so it's funny because I, I remember distinctly thinking with a lot of these stories, like this is totally not my jam, but Oh my gosh, it's so good Thank in you. winning me over. And that's something that I say is a big compliment. And I want people to realize that, um, like it is not a genre that I'm typically into, but I totally love it. And we're going to talk about your novel Vermilion, which I absolutely love here in a oh, little bit, yeah. but pretty mouth. Like how did that book come together? And, and you know, how did this first shot across the bow like happen with, with Molly Tanzer as a writer? You know, it's interesting. Like, and I want to kind of, I'll talk about a couple different things here because um, I'm really excited to announce that um a pretty mouth. So like I, I, I did publish my first two books and then a third novella later with a publisher that no longer exists called um, Lazy Fascist that is not a fascist publisher. Like in 2021, it's like really important, I think, to like be like, <laughs> when I, when I agreed it's to a work a sarcastic that, name. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And like it was in 20, this was like in 2010, 2011, when like the cultural conversation around ironic, I, on like ironic names like that and, and all of that stuff, like, um, had not really happened. And it was one of those things that um, like, as it's just like, it's, it's such a strange name to hear out of context, right. And this like post Trump or like not even post Trump, but like post Trump presidency era. Right. And so like, just to get end up with a very lazy fascist. (laughs) Yeah. And so like, just to explain that to anyone who may not know me or not know this publisher, that basically that publisher was the avant-garde wing of the bizarro movement of the sort of eraser head based bizarro movement. And then, that imprint in particular sort of took a different approach to Bizarro. 
Um, and so, yeah, like I, um, those books have fallen out of print and they are going to be uh, republished this year. Um, pu- like I think in, in May, I'm not quite sure with um, Word Horde who put out Vermilion. And I'm really excited that A Pretty Mouth, which is a sort of mosaic novel or collection of short stories. And then my second, my, my second novel, The Pleasure Merchant, and then a novella called Rebellion will all be out through Ross with sort of author's preferred editions because I did an edit on them, me here in 2020, or back in 2020, not 2012 era me, that we're very different writers. Um, so yeah, uh, that collection came about because um, I had written a story or a novel, a novelette, I suppose, called The Infernal History of the Ivy Ridge Twins. That was a Lovecraftian 18th century picaresque uh, about incestuous twin necromancers that came out in um, Sylvia Moreno Garcia's anthology, Historical Lovecraft. And around that time in like 2010, it was historical fiction in general was like a very hard sell. That was like the glory day of the, you didn't know your neighbor was a fairy urban fantasy, um, like sparkle core. I don't know what we would even call it in retrospect. And um, it was cool. And I read a lot of that stuff. Like I'm not against it at all, but uh, I just don't write that. And so she put out this call for historical Lovecraftiana. And I was like, I'm your girl. And I um, typed up this novelette and it is pretty weird and wild going back through and reading it as I did last year. And it um, was republished in Ross Lockhart's um, book of Cthulhu. Um, which was like a huge anthology of modern Lovecraftiana. And then my editor, Cameron, read it, reached out to me and was like, would you like to turn this um, novelette into a a novel? Would you like to work with me in that way? And I was like, well, here I have a pitch for you. Um, I'd like to write about different generations of these twins and do kind of like a Blackadder style anthology series with like um, different eras that this family um, has existed um, the uh, the Calapash family, and he really liked that idea, and that's how A Pretty Mouth came about. Yeah, and it's it's a really um, excellent book, and just um, and what was cool at the time, and one of the reasons why it was such a neat thing was that um, I hadn't seen anything like it, and <laughs> you know, and it was just it was such an original piece of work, and I think that that was always like the first thing about it that impressed impressed me and um well and vermilion uh was vermilion or the pleasure merchant your next novel um i had a strange publication so like i actually wrote the first draft of vermilion before i even wrote like the ivory bridge twins but it got revised and right revised and revised and um like my publication order is like a pretty mouth came out in 2012 and then i had a collection called rumbolian come out in 2013 and then Vermilion came out in 2015. And then also that year, The Pleasure Merchant came out like in a later month of 2015 because I had been, I, for a while, I, this is why I like weirdly burned out recently and like had to kind of take some time away and and, mm-hmm. and rest because I was just really, 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 really writing a lot at that time. And um, so I'd written Vermilion and revised it and that book took forever to sell because nobody thought that they could sell it. Um, and uh, only Ross was willing to take a chance on it. And then um, it's crazy to me because it's interesting. It's interesting. It's your, um, obviously your most commercial. Thing, yeah, like it really is like, it's strange and it's still, it, it is strange for any author like selling out is or earning out rather, I should say is something that all authors aspire to. And, uh, and it's, it's rough. It's a rough industry out there to like earn out your novel and Vermilion earned out almost instantly. And I still get royalty checks that are like more than a dinner from it. And I'm like, thank you. My best selling novel that came out through a, you know, a, a publisher that does not have, you know, the Great same sources. kind of or pull yeah. as someplace like HMH or Tor or any of those other publishers. And yet it is like far and away my bestseller. It's far and away my most popular book. And no one was willing to look at it except for Ross. It took a year and a half to sell. Which is so crazy to me because on paper, yeah. Million seems like the most easy sell. Um, yeah. You know, uh, like, so give people an idea of the concept of Vermilion. Vermilion is a weird Western about a psychopomp. Um, and, and psychopomp is a word that we get out of um, ancient Greece and it means like soul escort. And it's like, so like Mercury or Hermes, I guess, or like um, various other 
mythological figures throughout history are considered psychopomps. Like if you escort the dead into the world of the dead, that is like what you are called. And so um, in this, however, it is like an alternate history where ghosts and there are some talking animals and spirits and um, supernatural beings abound. And so our heroine Lou is sort of like a gender fluid individual who's also biracial and she's living in San Francisco of 1870 and her profession is psychopomp. Like if you are experiencing being haunted, she will come to your home or wherever this haunting is occurring and try to reckon with the dead and get them to pass smoothly into the afterlife. Because like the longer the dead stay in our world, the more, the worse that is for everybody. So she sort of performs this necessary office and she has sort of a cool, I mean, this was like 2015, right? So she's got the full on steampunk arsenal of like, everything you could possibly imagine with like a hand, like a doctor's bag full of like weird arcane items, like a bee that you can wind up that the dead, like when they hear it, they become fascinated by it. And she also has a, like a, an archaic pistol, the Lamat, which was an amazing firearm from the past that had both like a revolver and also like a smoothbore cylinder that you could fire either buckshot or like a 60, um, like a, like a big shotgun shell. Basically it was like really crazy hand weapon. And she makes her own bullets that have are infused with vermilion uh, powder, the like red mineral and the, and vermilion, hence the title of the book, um, which was not the original title, but uh, was a good marketing move by Ross. Um, if the dead encounter vermilion, it freezes them. It basically like stops them dead in their, dead in their tracks, so to speak, which is an idea I wholesale stole out of, um hong kong cinema vampire movies like mr vampire and um like uh a ghost love story and all of those sort of uh, like, hopping vampire style hopping vampire yeah the like young se jang shi um where you will see like if you've seen these movies basically like there's like a red piece of paper that someone has written characters on with vermilion ink and you slap it on a vampire's head and they're like and they freeze and they uh and they can't move anymore. And so like lifting that from Hong Kong cinema and other, and just sort of like, I took a lot of different influences with it. And she herself is half Chinese. So is Vermilion the first attempt at a novel that you, you made or wrote? No, I, I, it is my first, it is my debut novel in that it was the first bought and first published. However, I, um, I, I wrote two books before that, that I, tr- one I trunked and the other, I just deleted off my laptop because it was like <laughs> during the time that they'd done Harper Lee so dirty with um, Ghost of a Watchman. And I was like, if I ever make it famous, I don't want anyone, my like bereaved, I don't want anyone trying to make a book on <laughs> Juvenilia, right? And so I just deleted this novel off my computer and no copy exists as far as I know. So Vermilion was my third attempt. Just because one of the other things that we have in common is my first attempted well my first attempt at a novel my first serious novel was hunting the moon tribe which was also chinese vampires oh yeah Uh, that's right that's we bonded over that at like a lovecraft film festival yes we did um yeah yeah, chinese vampires and the hopping kind are are, i'm a big fan of too which is one of the reasons why vermilion like like hit me so well and i I don't mean this as an insult but like with pretty mouth um what are the funny thing i mean this as a compliment like one of the things that I thought about your work early on and a lot of your work is that it's operating on a level that sometimes I don't know because I know you're putting a lot of your studies and things into it. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just know that, okay, I'm not getting everything, but I know it's really cool and it's really (laughs) smart. And one of the things I like about Vermilion is, is Vermilion is a book that like, um, like I get it. I get all of it, you know, and I, and I know some of it I had to look up and some of it I had to, I, I, you know, but mostly like I, it just, I connected with it really, really fast. So I love Vermilion and, and, and that. that is, I definitely think it's a good starting place or yeah. pre mouth would be a good one too, but I think Vermilion's a good starting place for people to check it out. It really wears its heart on its sleeve in a way that um, I haven't been able to, I don't know. It's interesting. Like I'm sort of at a weird crossroads in my own work and the things that I'm doing and the, my work in progress right now after completing my uh, trilogy is very, very different. It's radically different. And it also is, it's like, a, it's fully a second world fantasy. Um, it's not historical at all. Uh, it's set in another world. And, um, but it's also wearing its heart on its sleeve in a way that I felt free to write in a way that I have not sort of felt free to write since I was like composing Vermilion like a zillion years ago. And so it's, I am 
it's interesting hearing you talk about this because I sort of know my compositional state of mind when I was working on Vermilion and now I, and I, and I feel like I'm in the same space again where um, before I was kind of doing something else. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And so, um, and I want to, so it's funny because your work has been called horror, fantasy, science fiction, erotica, Lovecraftian, bizarro, new weird has been called all these things. And I think, uh, yes, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> it is a thing, but um, at the same time, like, um, I think that's so rad that it gets all those those names because, really, in the end, um, when especially for people that have made it this far in the interview, and they they're they've been hearing so much about your roots and what you read as a child and all the things is it's it's such a great alchemy of of you as an author and your influences and and and, and your work and not every author is. Um, such an original blending of, of these things. And that's one of the things that yeah. I, I appreciate about your work. So um, the Pleasure Merchant, like um, yeah. what was that about? Pleasure Merchant is an eight is what is the Pleasure Merchant? Um, it's, it was my attempt at writing an, 18th century novel, which sounds really weird, but at the same time, like 18th century novels are fascinating to me in a lot of ways because there's an academic argument to be made that the novel as we conceptualize it today really began in 18th century England. And like, I, that is a, that is a a claim that immediately begs to be challenged. Right. And like, we can look at something like the tale of Genji, or we can look at something like um, Don Quixote, and we can look at all these things that are novel, a, like novel like that came before but um there is the argument that is made or even or even romance of the three kingdoms in china or right. the to the west or yes know. and so there's so the, the the specific claim about the 18th century in england is that with the publication of these novels that we seem that we see coming out during that time is that they became interior in a way that things weren't really interior before. Like Don Quixote is not an interior book. It is a romance in the sense that he is like going forth and he's adventuring and he's doing all these things. I think like Genji is much more interior, um, but that mm-hmm. when we start the 18th century, we see books with titles like Robinson Crusoe or the memoirs of Miss Betsy Thoughtless or oh, I see. Um, okay. Clarissa, right? And like right. the reason that these are their titles is they're about these people and they mark their internal change from one point to another in a way that you don't Instead really see a bunch of events that happen. Yeah. Like they, they're that sort of idea of like a soul that changes over time is, is maybe what the novel is. And like part of the problem, I think when we talk about the novel is that the novel has become our primary mode of consuming and it has like a prestige status, right? Like novel, oh, a novelist as opposed to like a short story writer, like there's sort of a legitimacy that novels confer that I think is, undeserved and makes it sort of that we want to claim that things are novels and like the novel means a certain thing but if you but I but anyway so like that's sorry that's my magpie brain again but like when I set out to write the pleasure merchant I was like I want to write a novel in the mode of the 18th century but I don't want to make it like weird style like I don't the 18th century style is like hard to read um like when you go back and you read these books like they're slow and they there's a lot of stuff you don't need in there, right? Just in my opinion. Not that I, I mean, yeah. not that I would dare edit Daniel Defoe, but like, um, you know, there's just a lot going on that we don't necessarily want here in like the 21st century. And so I started to write a 21st century, 18th century novel. And so it is a picaresque about a young wig maker's apprentice who is un- accused of a crime he did not commit and fired from his apprenticeship and then becomes um, like a valet to a gentleman and has like a meteoric rise through London society and then falls just as quickly and maybe further than he fell. So it's, it's, it's got that sort of strange moral ambiguity of something like Barry Lyndon, um, the Kubrick film, or, um, you know, so it's, it's pretty dark. Um, and it is an exploration of this individual, this wig maker's apprentice. And it is probably my most, I don't really do the erotica thing as much anymore. Like that's just not the mode that I use to express myself, but it's probably my horniest book. I would definitely say that like, if, if you're interested in like a horny book, that is definitely the one for you. And it will be coming out later this year as well. So from a uh, uh, WordPress, right? From or Word, 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 yeah. Sorry. Word, yeah. Um, he, he acquired all three of my out of print backlists and we'll be releasing them um, as like cool. almost like a set. So well, Ross is a very smart man, smart editor. Yeah. He's fun to work with. 
Yeah. Um, and so then um, you started working with um, a New York publisher on a, a trilogy, but they're standalone novels. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the Diabolicist Library Trilogy? And and um, I'm probably probably said that wrong, but um, but this so, trilogy you just finished, right? I did. I just it just concluded last year. So the Diabolists Library are um, three standalone novels that do kind of fit together. If you it, they reward the reader of all three, but you can read them in any order, and they're about three different sets of people, and that's how I kind of wanted them to be. As I wrote the first one as a standalone, and my publisher was like, "We'd love to see another," and I'm like, "Well, I cannot." I don't know. One of the reasons I dropped out of my PhD is like, I don't have the attention span to work on something for like multiple years. Like I, I get really into something and I write it and then I'm done with it. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to survive writing a trilogy about these same characters. Plus I think that the first one creatures of will and temper is it's a self-contained story. I always imagined it as having a beginning, a middle and an end. And I didn't want to milk it for more than that. Right. Um, It had concluded in my mind. And so the first one is sort of a woman centric potentially feminist, depending on how you define that word, retelling a picture of Dorian Gray, but with um, like lesbians and sword fighting and demons. And um, if that sounds good to you, you will probably like it. That seems to be people's experience of it. Um, It's probably my favorite book I've published to date. Um, The second one is called Creatures of Want and Ruin. It is set on Long Island during the Jazz Age. And it's very, uh, and my family originally is from Long Island. We're not Southerners by by nature. My dad, my, my parents moved when my mom was pregnant by me and well, pregnant with me. And um, both my parents are from Long Island. I used to go to Long Island all the time as a kid. Um, and I wanted to write about my experiences going out on the bay and um, fishing and boating and the sort of culture out there. And um, so that middle book is very it's, it's very um, like F. Scott Fitzgerald influenced as well as Pulp Fiction influenced. There's like references to H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and things like that in there because one of the characters is a big reader of the pulps during that time. And then the third that came out last year, almost exactly a year ago, um, April 20th, I guess, well, that's the date. We're, we're recording this on April 18th, so about a year ago. We're the almost third, the anniversary, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Creatures of Charm and Hunger is set at the tail end of World War II, and it takes place in the north of England in a village called Hawkshead, which is um, like a very remote um, village in the Lakes area and um, Lakes District. And it's actually where Beatrix Potter was um, lived. And it's close to where like a lot of sort of iconic British art- authors existed. And it's about um, like a young Jewish refugee who has left Germany and is hiding in the north of England in this tiny town um, to escape the Nazis. And um, Yeah, that one, um, I'm very excited. It was just uh, a finalist for the Colorado Book Award. And again, the the genre of of historical fiction, when they have an S, like a fantasy and science fiction category, and like, I'm happy with anything. Like, I love that it's in historical fiction, because it is very historically based. But they actually told me, they were like, we're not sure we were going to put this in the category. And I was like, that's me. So that was kind of fun. Yeah, I don't know where I fit. So where I fit. Yeah. So put me in, and that works, and and that's really cool on the nomination. Thank you. Yeah, I'm uh, excited. And speaking of awards, uh, <laughs> which is the reason we're here. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> uh, in the end, uh, well, no, and I really wanted everyone to get a picture of of you and your work, that's and, fun. and and everything that you you've been doing, and. Um, speaking of somebody who, um, ha- who met you very early on in your career, uh, all through, all through the way, I've been so impressed with with everything that you've done and and, and you. have achieved so far. And I know we have a long way to go, so yeah, and a lot more work to do. We both come. I mean, we were both starting with bizarre fiction and doing all those things, and then sort of been moving into other creative modes since then. So it's nice to meet a fellow traveler or talk to a fellow traveler in that way. <laughs> Right, right, and um, you know it's 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 been awesome to 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 see that, and I think one of the reasons why when I heard that you were going to be a judge for the PKD award, I was very excited because um, I know you're a person of of very good taste, but I also foresaw immediately foresaw that I wanted to have this conversation because. Um, You know, we cover, you know, we've been doing this podcast for three years now, and every year when the PKD judges are announced, we mention it to our listeners, and we remind people the address where they can send books, you know, to be considered and and all that. 
Um, in our first interview, uh, fellow Colorado, uh, our first interview on this podcast was Carrie Vaughn, who oh, uh, also from Colorado, because right after we started the podcast, she won the PKD award for yeah. Uh, the incredible novel Bannerless, and um, so we had her on. So th there is Colorado PKD Award symmetry here. Yeah, uh, she actually like. I mean, we we don't live too far from one another. We're I mean, like Carrie's like a friend of mine, and um, I and she actually and actually Bannerless came out through the same publisher as my Diabolus Library trilogy. Um, so like, yeah, I've been like a huge. I love her work, and I was fascinated by Bannerless, and. Um, I was really Banner excited was on that one. Yeah, that's really, really good. Yeah, yeah. She was our first interview. So. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Um, and so, but the, the PKD award, she won the award for this. And a lot of people don't realize that, I, I know some people want, they think that the book should be awarded to the most what is reality book that came out of the year, or which book questions reality the most, or tricks people into thinking that, like main character is not an android or yes. whatever they think is and you know it's funny because as the people who do the pkd you know we've read now 26 pkd novels for this podcast and people a lot of times don't realize that a lot of what makes pkd pkd isn't so much the things that have made the pkd movies his yeah. humor, but most of all is his commitment to how much of that output were paperbacks. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, paperbacks so how did you get involved in doing, uh, being a judge? Like, this is awesome. I, 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 I'm, I'm jealous of your, um, of your role here. I want to know how that happened and, and why. <laughs> um, well, you know, I... I, I'm not quite sure on the whole process of it, but basically um, the Philip K. Dick Award uh, is a juried award. Mm -hmm. And um, typically those juries are comprised of current authors in the field. And um, I knew one of the jurors last year and he asked if I would consider the idea of being a juror maybe. And I was like, yeah, sure. Um, we'll like, I guess, because they kind of like, you, I guess you're allowed to sort of like suggest someone on your way out. Mm -hmm. And so um, I was like, that sounds interesting. Like, I'd be curious. I've never done this before. Um, I've never, I've judged a few smaller things over the years, but nothing so grand as the PKD. And I was thrilled when apparently that, um, you know, they considered me worthy of this honor and reached out to me. And I said, yes, and that I would love to, be a part of the jury this year. And so I'm not quite sure how. Um, and so I, you know, I don't know how often people say yes or no. I was not involved in that process. I just said like, yeah, maybe um, like a couple, you know, at some point. And um, then that was followed through by, by the awards committee. The um, mass market paperback is almost like a thing of the past at this point. Like now it's like a sign, like the mass market paperback is almost a sign that you've really made it. If you get um, like a mass market trim size on uh, as a, that usually that comes after a massive success in either trade or um, hardcover. Right. And it used right. to be that like um, trade, like mass market paperbacks were like the bargain basement title. Right. Like, I mean, that's like the least prestigious now. And now it's like a weird benchmark of like, Oh, you did so well that we issued a mass market of your work. And it's just like, Oh, an honor. I have never even like considered at this point. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. 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 Do you have a history of, of, of reading PKD? Do you, I mean, and it's not required. I'm not as familiar with his work as I should be. I've definitely read a few things over the years. I'm more familiar with him in adaptation. Um, I, I have read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And I began something else and then set it down. But no, I'm not as versed in his long form mm -hmm. uh, fiction as you know but i have seen like a ton of his adaptations and things like that um but yeah no it's interesting i have been thinking he's very about close to you too so right? in, he's buried in colorado too so i had no, do you know where uh i think near fort morgan um 
but uh, they have a festival for PKD in Fort Morgan. And, I'll have to and check it. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm, I've not heard of this somehow in spite of living in Colorado since 2009. So I will have to check this out, but I'm not quite sure where Fort Morgan, and off the top of my head, I don't know where Fort Morgan is compared to me. So I'll, I'll see if it's drivable. I think it's pretty central because, and the reason why PKD was buried in, in Colorado is that he was born, I believe, well, he was born in Chicago, but uh, briefly after, uh, a short time after, um, his sister, his twin sister died a- as an infant, and she was buried in Colorado. And so he was buried with his twin sister, which is one of the reasons why twinning and, and weird doubles and doppelgangers are... are right are uh, an ongoing theme in his work because of, of, of the, of the sister. Um, and, and so they're, they're buried in Colorado. Um, sorry to get off on a PKT. No, that's like fascinating. It's almost, that's almost kind of the premise of, um, I wonder if that's sort of where the idea of the premise for the prestige came from, because that's sort of part of the, of the novel, not the film, which cuts out yeah. the frame story of the prestige, but in this frame story of the prestige, which is also about identity and twinning and all of these things. Mm-hmm. There's like a, a frame story about someone who's like infant twin passed away and yet they have this sense of being doubled and being, having a relationship and things like that. Yeah. Well, the, the, the ghost of his sister uh, looms like over his work in a, in a way that, it's really fascinating if you are looking for it in his work um, from time to time. And even some of the pulpiest and cheesiest of, of stories, like little, little hints of, of the sister kind of mm-hmm. end up and, you know, I mean, well, one of the frustrating things with PKD is and, and as somebody who has just done a podcast, breaking down 26 of his novels is that we, we can tell when it's happy Phil and when it's getting divorced Phil and, you know, so many of these things. I believe it. You know, yeah. I absolutely believe that given the, given how much has, up, given the upheavals that I have experienced in just the span of time that I have been writing professionally, I can look back on my own work and be like, oh yeah, that's when I was getting divorced as opposed to like other times in my writing career and stuff. So I absolutely believe that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Well, anyways, but the but it is interesting for me. Like, um, like I said, it, you didn't have to have a prerequisite in PKD, and in fact, it's probably a good thing because the award is is and people have to remember this: the award is for paperback mm-hmm. science fiction publishing. And you know, if you look at some of the people, like you look at last year's winner, Sarah um, Pinsker. Um, you know, she's a very modern writer and and modern eyes are the ones that found her as the, as the winner. And, um, you know, by the way, her novel, the song for a new day, which totally kind of foresaw 2020, um, wasn't even the one that won, you know, it was her short story collection. It's so, so cool. But, you know, it's an interesting award is what I'm saying. And and, it it is for, and I like too, that it's for first run, paperback as well i mean you can't submit something that came out in hardcover first and then was reissued in paperback it is for paperback originals and i do think that that is really nice and it does sort of i mean when you when when i when i was asked to do this i looked over the the history of the word because i was aware of it because i remember you know i with when carrie won and um and also i I mean i'm i've met like meg elison and a couple of the other awards over the uh, people who have won over the years and um i was like very fascinated to see sort of like what the fine, you know, on the Wikipedia, there's like all the finalists and the winners and things like that. And I did a little bit of my own data management and it's fascinating to see like it small press reigns supreme with it. You know, like it's like, I think the last time tour one was 2012 um, HMH is, and they're not, I mean, they're based out of Boston and they're not big five, but um, well, they were just acquired. I don't know. They were just acquired. So like, who knows at this point, but like uh, they're still a large publisher. HMH is a large publisher. And those two are the, only huge publishers that have won over the past 10 years, essentially. It really is a place that like, not just paperbacks, but especially like revolutionary small press paperbacks, I think have a place to um, really be exhibited and, and you can kind of see what's going on with like things that publishers weren't as willing to take a chance on. Um, so. Well, and, and I think it's also uh, the way that the publishers interact with the judges in this award is very important. Like, I personally believe a couple years ago that um, 
Uh, Cody Goodfellow's on America should have been should have been in the in the contention, but you know, speaking personally as the person who sent a lot of emails to uh, King Shot saying like, "Hey, these are the judges. You guys got to do this." You know, if if um, you know the judges are they're a jury, and you have to be able to put the work in front of them and, yeah. and make sure that they they know that it exists because you guys are going to be reading a lot of work specifically for this and um, it's up to the publishers to do it too. So you can't be upset yeah. with the jury if the thing that you thought should win <laughs> wasn't there because a lot of it has to do with, you know, making sure that the jury has knowledge of what was released in the year too, I think. Yeah, I think that um, the committee does a pretty good job reaching out to people, but you, I mean, you can't twist people's arm to send a book. And last year was very interesting because of, um, from what I heard, just because of uh, COVID and stuff, there were a lot more eBooks. And um, I hope that the, the willingness, I mean, this year, the jury, we're all very excited about eBooks, like send eBooks. It's great. Um, You know, physical copies is great too. Like just, our names and addresses, I think, appeared in Locus, and they're findable on the on the website. And you know, so like, find us and look at us. Let's look us up and send us copies. And you know, with and we actually, I mean, like, we have a Slack set up and we have everything. And so like, if even if you can only sort of track down one of us, we will give it to everyone else. And so like, we're very hopeful that, um, as always, that publishers enthusiastically submit to us. And um, I know that we've all sort of um, talked. We've already the jury talked about how. Um, we want, we are all keeping an eye out for things that we want to see and we want like people to send. And so I've actually sent in a few requests to the award um, committee to be like, this is a book that I would like to see, like, please pursue this one if you can. Um, And so uh, hopefully the fact that all of us seem very enthusiastic about finding off the beaten path things will mean that we'll get, we'll get off the beaten path things. And then we'll also like find people that we can actively be like, send us your books, please. Like we want to, we want to read them. We want a full picture of the field so that we can make the judgment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just keep in mind too. And I'm reminding people and the authors that are out there that um, it doesn't have to sound like, or feel like Philip K. Dick wrote it or a lost PKD book. It can be, Uh it's just a paperback original. um, And, And Go it's ahead. Thing too that like don't what I hope that anyone who might be encountering this in the wild um, who has a book that they might think is eligible like don't don't pre-reject either about like well is it science fiction enough like we are like is it science fiction is a question that we are going to be discussing and what that means because science fiction can mean all different kinds of things at this point. And mm-hmm. I would, you know, we would rather be the ones to decide if something is science fiction or not, rather than someone who's like, well, there's only this speculative element and is it too fantasy? And it's like, just send it. Is it too horror? Is it too? Yeah, just send yeah. it. Just yeah. send it. Like if it's horror adjacent, if it's horror with the science fictional element, if it's fantasy with like a science fiction, just send it. Um, like we want to read it like all. you guys do the deciding there, well, right? It's like a huge thing. You know, I think authors are very authors and sometimes publishers are far too willing to be like, Oh, well, they won't even look at that. And it's like, you never know. Like you yeah. really know, like bannerless, I think has some very high concept science fiction stuff in it, but it's a murder mystery. I mean, that's, it is a detective story and it ha- has roots in noir and it has roots in all different kinds of things, but it is science fiction and it won. And so like, just don't, I just hope that people, our start who are familiar with the award um, start to realize that like, we want to see everything. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and Bannerless part of what, I mean, what's cool too. I just, just cause you mentioned that novel and I loved it. It's is, great. Um, and if you go back and listen to uh, the dickheads first interview with Carrie, you can tell it was funny because I had just finished rereading the dispossessed by Le Guin. Oh, right. Yeah. And then read Bannerless, which is in, entirely influenced by the dispossessed is because bannerless is almost like a murder mystery crossed with dispossessed and in many ways in the kind of anarchist ideas that were in there and what's cool is is that um carrie wasn't a big pkd reader either but her publisher does a lot of the pkd books so it's funny because she kept saying like she got her publisher sent her a step one of her publishers publishes pkd and they sent her when she won the award a stack of pkd books right but she wasn't a big pkd reader and she didn't need to be she didn't need to be no it's to, um to, i mean i 
to win this award. Yeah. Absolutely not. No, it really is just like exceptional achievement in paperback. You know, it is named for him because he was so often published in paperback and that, and you know, is science. I, I think it's like a wonderful thing, but it's strange. I mean, we've been having this sort of cultural conversation about awards named for people. Like this is like a big button issue in science fiction and fantasy publishing right now. Like, I mean, in 2020, no, 2019, we had the big conversation about the Campbell Award. Yeah. That is not the astounding award. Um, the otherwise award that used to be the Tiptree Award. And like the dick has kind of escaped this trend towards honoring the achievement rather than the person. And, um, you know, I don't think that that will be changed. I don't have any, I don't have any knowledge of anything having to do with whether that will change with time. And I don't, you know, who knows, right? And I think there were very legitimate reasons for changing the Campbell and the tip tree to other names and things like that, right? But like, it is, I think one of the reasons, the only, you know, one of the reasons I think that it can be constraining is like, well, is this book Philip K. Dickey, Dickensian enough? And it's like, well, no, it doesn't matter. Like, and I, and as much as I love that it honors him and his tradition of publishing, like I, I do sometimes wonder if people self-reject because it's not like a computer made a twin of me you know that kind of, and it's like no it's fine it's fine it's fine <laughs> like well and and the thing too is that people have to remember like they forget that he published over 30 novels and oh, yeah. they're not all mm-hmm. like the same and you know uh you can't you know galactic pot healer is not like wouldn't be if you put galactic pot healer up necessarily you'd think it was more lovecraftian than pkd you know with the large creature living under the the water and the, you know, just, you know, it doesn't have to be, um, it doesn't have to feel like a typical PKD and it's about the, it's the paperback thing. Yep. Yep. It's about the paperback. So, okay. So what about the process in the next year is the thing that most excites you about doing this? You know, this is like a strange mission, but like, so when, so the, the Trump era took a lot from a lot of people, especially that psychic energy. I think it was very, very difficult, I think, for some to step away from what was happening and what continues to happen um, enough to, uh, to lose oneself in the fictional. And I, for, for many people, I mean, and I think that a lot of people maybe experienced um, some of what, uh, some of that during this last pandemic year as well. I mean, I have a ton of friends who are voracious readers who are like, I can't read anymore. I like, I'm a me- I do 10 minutes and then I look at my phone and I've doom scrolled for an hour and then I have to go to bed, right? Like, so this, this, this frazzling or this, dis- this inability to disconnect from the news has been something that's been very troubling to, I think, a lot of people. And that was definitely my experience. I had not been reading a ton um, for the last couple of years, you know, I would, I would find a book and I would devour it. And then I'll be like, it's been three weeks since I finished that book. What am I reading now? And then I would pick up something new and, but it wasn't as much a part of my life as it was before then. And I've started to get better in my brain about it. And last year I really started reading heavily again. And so I'm very excited this year to have all these books come straight to me that I will be reading for this award. And I think it's going to be a very healing thing um, for my mind to sort of be like, no, it's because I'm, I'm a workaholic. And, um, and if something is work, I will do it. Whereas if something is not work, even if it's true that reading in my field is work for me as an author, it doesn't feel the same way as work that I have to do as like a freelancer or work that I need to do creatively. Whereas this year reading will now be work. And so I can justify spending like hours and hours and hours on it. So I'm very excited when the books start rolling in. Um, Send us your books uh, because uh, I'll be literally justified in being like today, I just get to read all day and it will, it will be work that I get to do. That is my work that I do. And I think that will be a very good, that's what I'm really thrilled about is just seeing what the field is like. Right. And uh, now you did say early on that science fiction is a, was a tough sell for you. Um, do you still feel that way about science fiction or no? no? As a kid, as a kid, I just wanted, I mean, it's interesting. Um, as a kid, all I wanted was like to ride around on a dragon or large beast of some sort and like slay monsters in another land. And these days I tend to be a lot more interested in various kinds of, vegan baking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, 
And, uh, you know, what, I think probably one of my favorite books that I read last year was science fiction. Becky Chambers is uh, To Be Taught if Fortunate, which, like, I can't even talk about because I'll start crying. Like, I have not ugly sobbed over a book like that, in, like, for, and I have not since. And I could not stop crying at the end of To Be Taught if Fortunate. Like, oh, my God, it had the most affecting. It was just the most amazing journey with the most affecting ending. And so, like, no, I, I started to enjoy it's a lot. It's been on my list for, to read. Uh, I never even read Wayfarers, right? Like this was the only time I haven't read anything of her since then either. I got absorbed into a couple other things, but man, to be taught a fortunate, just like wrecked me. And, uh, and so such amazing things about her. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it'll change your life. I mean, I made my mom read it. She's like, this was really good. And she, she, you know, I talked a lot about my dad. My mom is also a voracious reader and she tends to gravitate more towards historical fiction, but she does like, she often read whatever my dad was reading. And so it was very well read in like 80s and 90s era of fantasy and science fiction, um, at least. And then, so these days she's very open to reading it and she loved it too. And I sent it to my agent and she was like, this made me sob. And I mean, it's just like one of the, it's just so good. So yeah, like, um, no, I've started to read more science fiction. I really like it, um, especially because I've started redressing my dearth of um, like Japanese authors. And I've been sort of addressing that and reading about, and and so I just finished um, uh why can I not remember a uh, woman in the dunes, which is sort of mm. like, if it's, is it science fiction? I don't know. I'm reading uh, next up is of his for mine is inter ice age four, which uh, by Kobo Abe, which is um, very science fictional. Um, and so like, I've been reading some of that and I've been reading more science fiction in general to try to prep for this. So yeah, I don't know. I changed and I think that's fun. And so like, I'm very excited to read, especially some hard SF. Like that's something that I rarely pick up on my own where it's like this book accurately represents science. And I'm like, cool. And like, it's, that doesn't compel me. Not normally your thing, right? So if, if, you know, when I hear something about a book that makes me like grab it immediately, that's usually not it. And that, um, but I'm really delighted to have an, opportunity to read books outside of my normal sort of like oh I gotta have that or I gotta have that so. yeah and you brought up something now we did a panel recently with a friend of ours uh, Nick Mamatas about uh, what he was one of the guests on uh, our Asian um, sci-fi and translation oh right yeah yeah and I re I've read a lot of Chinese science fiction just because my interest in Chinese fiction started when I was researching Hunting the Moon Tribe and read the romance of three kings and all that. So I, I admit I've read, I've read a little bit of Japanese science fiction, but I've read more Chinese science fiction, but you recently started at, um, doing work with, with Japanese sci-fi through, for, through uh, manga. Can you tell our uh, listeners about that? Yeah. Um, so on, so part of what I do these days, my, my main side hustle is I work in um, manga adaptation. And so um, like, some publisher like basically i don't translate japanese um i but what i but i do have a little bit of a background in the language that's from from like thousands of years ago when i was very young and um i understand a little bit about like the grammar and things like that and so i i'm in a good position as an ad, as an adapter where basically i take a raw translation and i will do things to it to make it read as me read a little bit more vibrantly in English because that's the, one of the problems that we have with works in translation is that there's this sort of um, tension between like wanting an accurate representation of the work and then wanting the people who are reading it in the new language to have the same localized, vibrant experience of the work that someone who is reading it in the original language would, right? And a one-to-one translation can never achieve that just because that's not how language works. And so translators do various adaptation on their own while translating. And then sometimes someone like me will be brought in to do a little bit more with the text to get it to read a little bit more like a native English text. And so I've done um, a couple of works with uh, Viz Media and a couple other publishers. Um, The one that I think is probably the most exciting is, um, well, that's unfair, but my favorite, I guess I'll put it that way. My favorite so far has been The Drifting Classroom by Kazuo Umez, which is actually a 1970s era horror manga that is also science fictional and speculative about um, an elementary school that is the entire school, everyone there that day on the grounds and the grounds themselves are transported somehow to like another place and time. And it's like a horrifying, desolate world of horrors. And they kind of have to survive. I'm already sold. It is very, very, I will, I will say that it is very, like, very, very dark. If you are uncomfortable with terrible things, 
being done to kids that are like, like violence. It's a very hard read. And the middle book actually features like a plague. So it was like, a, it was, I was given like a couple of authors copies and I was, cause it's like a three volume, gorgeous, like perfect edition that they did. And um, I was going to give them as like holiday presents this year. And I was like, not this year, not this year for this. Um, because yeah, like the plague stuff alone was just sort of like, ugh. like they're really, really dark and really, really good. Um, but you kind of have to be in the right place for wanting that just because yeah, it's unrelenting. And it, I do think it has a, a redemptive ending, but like, you're like, this is why I read this. But like, there are moments that even I working with it, um, you know, sort of from the copy I had to like my laptop was just like, why am I, you know, like, Oh my God, like, how could they do anything more to these, these poor children? And then like at the end was like, all right, that was a good journey. So I think it's, I think it's fantastic. And he's a very interesting manga artist. Right. Um, and yeah. that sounds great. I, I darker the better for me. So yeah, if you, if that's what you want, if like Mar means black, and that's what you like, right? Like that's like then this is like definitely the text. If you're like, I want to know what can be t- like the horrors of you know, it, great. I think it's fantastic. All right. Well, uh, Molly, how can our listeners um, track you down? Find your work. Um, they don't have to track you down, but follow your work. <laughs> Hunter to the end of the. I don't like that idea. Track. Find you online to follow your work. <laughs> um, I'm on social media. I think I'm, my Instagram handle is like at Molly underscore Tanzer. I'm um, Wicked Milk Hotel on Twitter, but I'm on both of those sites. My Facebook, I keep a little bit more locked down just because mm-hmm. it's Facebook. But um, if you usually if somebody's like, hi, I heard you on this thing, I'll like immediately friend you. But like a weird rando, I'm always just like, who are you? And are you going to yell at me? Um, so like, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Twitter and Instagram are the good ways to find me. I have a website. Um, I actually have a story out right now in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. That's a novelette um, called In the Garden of Ibn Ghazi that if you are into really, I mean, it's like a weird frame narrative story. It's like me on my bullshit, ultimately. Like, I, I guess I would say, like, if you want to, like, do a shot of me, that is, like, a good story for that because there's, like, weird stuff and like strange narrator narrators and like different narrators and time period stuff and alchemy and um it's also like a big nod to arkham horror the board game if you've ever played that i love that story it's like one of my favorites and um got my trilogy out and like yeah i'm working on a new novel and you can kind of follow me on my social media as i shouldn't complain about it as much as i am (laughs) well and let's point out that that is also a direct connection of your history to uh uh, one Philip K. Dick, who sold his first short story to Tony Boucher, the oh co-founder gosh. of the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. And yeah. um, his first story, also Richard Matheson sold his first story. Um, oh. When we did our tribute episode to Tony Boucher, we had uh, the owner of the magazine's fantasy and science fiction card, Von Gelder on, and he reached into his archives and pulled out the signature card for Richard Matheson's first sale. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah, that well, the Philip K. Dick Award, too. So Yeah, yeah. And and um so that there's a connection there too. Um but uh the uh, uh I was so stoked for you when you uh made that sale because that mm-hmm. is th- th- that's one of those Mount Rushmore uh, uh magazines to to crack and um it's just, it's so cool. Um, it's a and- huge honor. I'd never even submitted to them before because I felt very intimidated by it. And so it was lovely to submit my first, submit for the first time and have them be like, we would love it. And it's just like, oh my gosh, thank you. So it's such, it's, it felt like a huge honor and like a connection to the history of science fiction and fantasy publishing that, um, you know, it's in, I think it's important for us to be forging our own way and getting away from the past with our speculative fiction, but I also love to feel tied to the past in that way. And so it did really feel like a through connection to the amazing well, history. And Tony Boucher and uh, the magazine of fantasy and science fiction was one of the places you went to when your mm-hmm. politics were too um, left for uh, one person whose name we don't like to talk about anymore and uh, Tony Boucher was one of those was, was one of those voices, and it was specifically yeah. Tony Boucher was known for publishing um, uh, for not giving a crap uh, about gender and and where you came from, and and uh, you know he was in Berkeley, right? Yeah, <laughs> that, sure. 
back in the day. And, um, and so, and that was part of the revolutionary nature of that magazine for, for the yeah. genre early on. And, um, uh, yeah, it's a lovely publication, and I'm excited. And I, um, I'm excited because I, I've been, I, I got a subscription to it a little while ago, and I've been reading it, and it's been fun to have it in paper copy come to my house. Like I also feel because I hadn't really done that before. I pick up an issue, but like now I have my subscription where it like comes, and I get the like still that trim size, and the and it's just like oh my gosh, it's like very exciting. Yeah, and they've they made a real smart choice at editorship there too recently. Yep, I agree. Yep, and. All right, so uh, Molly, it was fantastic having you here to Thanks talk so about the work and uh, talk about the award. But here's the thing: we're going to have you back um, someday in the future. Uh, we just started the '70s with PKD, so oh, I imagine we'll be um, unlike what you were talking about. I think a lot of the books that got published after his death were ones he was struggling his whole life to publish. Yeah, and. Um, so we'll probably be in that era when, when you're, when you're post awards and we can talk about your experience then. And, um, and that'll be fun. Um, so, and listen, yeah, I, look forward to it. I think, I think the ceremony is usually in June. Um, and so um, I think it's like, it hasn't like last year's hasn't happened yet. I don't think, um, I don't know. I've had like a weird two weeks where I haven't been as much paying attention, but I think that they announced the winner. I know that I, I did. Yeah, I think so. Oh, I guess I must have been like, I'm, I, I don't, I, it's I could been be wrong. I, I maybe announced the nominees, actually. Um, I, thought, I thought maybe the nominees had been announced, but I don't know if the, on, I think that they took their con online and I think it was like, they made the choice because it was in May or June or something like that. So I'll have to look that up, but. Yeah, well, we'll um, find out and yeah. all the information about the awards will be in the show notes. And um, as always, uh, dickheads, uh, keep it paranoid, stay paranoid. And uh, we'll be uh, talking to Molly again when uh, the award is finalized. Yeah, it'll be great to see you all then again. Thank you so much. This has been really fun.